Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. It's myself, Paul Nealon, joined by Paul Tierney, Gary Kern and Peter Henry from the thefootballfaithful.com. And we're here to talk about the Premier League, which is back this Wednesday. Uh, this is the first of our Premier League videos that we'll be doing now weekly, on top of what we already do. So if you are a Premier League fan, happy days for you. If you're not, then go listen to our Irish football stuff. But Peter... Uh, I just mentioned there about the Football Faithful and do you want to tell our audience basically what you guys do at the Football Faithful and the fact that you have done up some pieces already on the topics we'll be talking about so if you want to take it away. Yeah, um, we've uh, obviously we're a, we're a kind of half Irish, half English website mostly focused on the Premier League. We do do a bit of Irish football as well but our Premier League would very much be our bread and butter. So we'd have all the latest news going up there day in, day out. And then we do a lot of kind of 90s. We do 90s podcasts, looking back at great 90s players, things like that. So there's a, there's a bit of something for, for everyone there, whether you're in for a, a serious read or just want to kind of look at some old goals or reminisce a bit. Um, but we put together a couple of pieces there today um, detailing both the race for the top four, which is lined up to be pretty interesting and then at the other end of the table which is also going to be interesting the race to beat the drop um so the pieces lay out exactly where every all the teams in them uh, particular races are sat at the moment in the table the difficulty of the features or the fixtures they have coming up and uh, yeah just a bit of information on each team injuries all the rest of it so it's a nice little guide um you can you know concise guide to exactly what we can expect to see over the next few weeks Peter, it must be strange um, writing about the top four and the bottom three or bottom four, bottom five or whatever and not writing about the title challenge because obviously Liverpool have that wrapped up for the first time in a good few years. There hasn't really been, it hasn't really been a race, has it? And the top four is actually more important than ever now, especially with, uh, you know, that Man City ban maybe coming in for two years or one year or wherever the appeal goes. Um, and there's some clubs there that some of them are, Obviously, form doesn't count, but some of them are, are up and down or topsy-turvy. And then you have teams like on the outside, Wolves and Sheffield United, that absolutely could go in for that fourth place, depending on how it goes with the restart. Yeah, no, and absolutely, like you said about the Man City thing, that's what makes it kind of even more interesting now, because the way that was originally set up was the verdict wouldn't come till after the end of the season, but that verdict is now due mid-July before the end of the season. So we'll actually know whether that fifth place is now enough Personal opinion, I think the lawyers will get them off, but you know yeah. there is a very big chance, or they might reduce it to one year anyway. They definitely won't get two, in, in my opinion. And um, but it does it makes it it's so interesting. Like you know, there really wasn't last year. Year was a really good title race, but there hadn't been one for a few years. And we all know Liverpool. You know, it's just a matter of getting the name engraved on the trophy now. At this stage, City. City are safe in terms of finishing second. No one's going to catch them. Leicester had looked, it had looked like the whole race was for months was just for the fourth position, basically, because Le Leicester also looked safe. Leicester have come back a little bit now. They're five points ahead of Chelsea. But if, if they can kind of get back on the bike a bit, their form slipped away a bit before the you know the pandemic and everything broke up, they, they still look in a, in a good place to finish in the top four. But... Chelsea have been in four plays for so long and it's just like all the rest of the teams just have just been seemed incapable of taking advantage. Chelsea actually haven't been as good. I know there's a feel good factor at the moment because they signed Timo Werner and, you know, they're linked with Havertz, but they've lost nine games out of 29. They've drawn another eight or something. And it just seems every time they've a poor result, Arsenal, Man United, um, Spurs, the, the traditional top six, just haven't been able to get their stuff together and go after them. And Sheffield, you know, Sheffield United, are, on paper, are in perfectly placed. They have a game in hand. Uh, they could move up level with Chelsea, I think it is, or even a point ahead of them. And, uh, you know, you the, the way Wolves have performed over the last couple of seasons, I think they might actually benefit from the break because they were looking a bit tired with a small squad and playing all the Europa League games. It, it's really set up to be fascinating. And the form of the traditional top six has been so poor this season that you really wouldn't count against Sheffield United or, or Wolves pulling something off, you know? Yeah, Paul, um, obviously you're an Arsenal fan. Is it a bit weird looking at the top four race and not seeing Arsenal like up there as much as they had been in recent years? Um, while you're kind of talking about Arsenal a bit, 
Pierre, do you want to uh, maybe get the fixtures ready for whatever teams and we'll kind of go through who's got kind of yeah. maybe the hardest running type of thing Absolutely. while Paul's speaking about Arsenal? Um, yeah, so so with, with Arsenal, obviously, they say fourth place is usually theirs, which it was for a few years. But in 17, 18, they had a similar season to this one where they just weren't firing, weren't getting going, were losing and drawing silly games against smaller sides. Um, this year, obviously, dropping out of the Europa League as well, was that was probably going to be their main chance of getting into the Champions League next year. And it was a shock that they did lose to Olympiacos. But um, I'm not surprised where they are because of the way they were playing under Emery. The style of football was shocking. They were conceding 15, 16 chances to teams like Southampton at home every week. And uh, even though last year they didn't prove, they were just constantly under pressure to a team that's considered better than them. Like, I think the stat for Arsenal, since 2015, they've not won away an away game against a top six side. And those are the sort of games you have to win. And if they're dropping points like that against small sides and then not beating teams who are directly beside them, you're not going to get in the top four. And Paul, like you as an Arsenal fan, obviously the last couple of years have been kind of topsy-turvy, but... and. Under Emery, obviously, everything was going wrong. Under Arteta, obviously, not lost a Premier League game yet, but it's still not quite there yet. And obviously, like you said yourself, the Europa League was the best way into the Champions League for Arsenal. What would be your realistic goals as an Arsenal fan for the rest of the season? They, they actually have lost Premier League game. They lost to Chelsea in December. Um, oh, I mean, under... under, um, under yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that was, that was under Arteta. Oh, was it? Okay, yeah, sorry. Under Arteta, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're unbeaten, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They um, in the league, yeah, they've they've yeah, um, yeah. they've improved, but it's still the same players. It's like United with Mourinho when Solskjaer first came in. Okay, they had a bit of an improvement, but ultimately they struggled after that. It's still the same players, and I, it's improved, but I mean they won one game in fifteen under Emery before he left, and then Youngberg came in as well, and I mean. That's that's atrocious. Like that's atrocious form for Southampton. Never mind the Arsenal. Like yeah. you know. So I mean, there's an improvement there, but I I I think I'd even question putting them in the top four race at times. To be honest, because they're just they draw too many games. The defense is shocking. I mean, I'd be happy with an FA Cup final. To be honest. Yeah. Do you think I'd, maybe I'd take any sort of cup final? Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you think you're kind of in that situation now? Because obviously the first game is against Man City, which I, you know, I think even most Arsenal fans would expect you to lose. Then I think the rate, you know, even talking about Arsenal in the top four just isn't mathematically possible. They could be twelve points off them with like eight or nine games, eight or nine games to go. I, if I was an Arsenal fan, I don't know how you feel about this. I'd say miss out in Europe altogether. Like don't be yeah. finishing sixth then. Um, so you actually have a clear run next year at the Premier League and improving. It, it should probably just be a season of consolidating under Arteta and then trying to improve next year. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. I think he needs to do an overhaul of the squad as well. There's some players there who simply shouldn't be there. Dead wood. Um, keeping a Baumiang is crucial as well. I don't know what the situation is there, but it seems like Arsenal are doing an Arsenal on it as they usually do with contracts. Um, but I mean, like not going into Europe, it could be like I don't think they'd be as good as the year Liverpool dropped out of Europe in 2014 when they ended up finishing second and probably should have won the league. But I think, yeah, I agree with you, it should be maybe, maybe a good thing to miss out on Europe altogether. Uh, Peter, for yourself, obviously, you're a Man United fan, and I think United fans at the moment are uh are quite happy, of course, with Bruno Fernandes coming in and, and kind of making the squad a little bit stronger. The team looks up for it now as well. So Ultra kind of has a handle on things. Um, and they have what looks like traditionally the easiest fixtures, the best running. And with Paul Pogba coming back from injury as well, do you think um, this is a perfect opportunity for United to, to grasp that Champions League spot? Yeah, it's a strange one. Uh, you said a little bit of, they look a little bit stronger uh, when Fernandes came in. I, you couldn't be more wrong, to be honest. And the reason I'd say that is because it's night and day. Man United pre-Bruno Fernandes and Man United post-Bruno yeah. Fernandes look, look like two completely different teams. Like, And even what you're saying about the on-paper easier run-in, that, that, that's a really interesting point because 
it, it was really bad for United up until, you know, kind of even by January, February, going into that Chelsea game where, where they won 2 0 and they would have been nine points away from Chelsea. Solskjaer's neck was almost on the line because some of the performances being served up were, were just absolutely diabolical and they become became very predictable that they were going to be really poor. And it was a strange one, I think, for most Man United fans, whether you're kind of pro Solskjaer or, or, or you, you kind of think that it, he was probably a bit of romanticism given the job, given him the job. Um, they were against the top six sides when it was, again, predictable where United could sit in and they could hit teams on the counter. Most of us went into them games not thinking, oh, we're definitely going to beat Man City or beat Chelsea, but we kind of felt more confident because we knew that was kind of our one trick as such. Um, and it was, a, even though it's, you know, a one trick, it, it was still pretty effective. But then against teams lower down in the league where we were expected to be, you know, to come out and play football, to break down those teams, we were just absolutely, we, we were lost for ideas. There was no creativity. You know, you had kind of Jesse Lingard or Andres Pereira playing in that kind of, you know, number 10 role trying to spark a bit of creativity and it just wasn't happening we, we were really poor poor to watch even for a neutral and it does seem a bit that that has now changed since Bruno Fernandes has come in and, and I think a lot of um, United fans were feeling a lot more confident before the break you know the break happened because we, we'd had that win over Chelsea we, we bet Man City and we had looked better against them uh, you know the teams further down in the league so it will be really interesting to see if we've really turned that corner against the teams that you said like on paper we should be beaten but that's yeah. kind of been our problem for most of the season as well so we just have to see how it plays out and then you have I suppose there's going to be a lot of narrative around how Pogba will fit in now with Bruno Fernandes as well and um, you know which one of them will probably take a step back in the midfield to accommodate the other one and um, so yeah but I think for United it's really crucial um, first game is is against Spurs away. That you know, Sky Sports will have that pumped to beyond belief. You know, with the Mourinho angle, Pogba, Mourinho, all the rest. But then we play Sheffield United at home, uh, two teams that are in and around us, and then we don't play another team in and around us for that Champions League spot until the last game against Leicester. So I think it's crucial for United to get four points out of those first two fixtures against Spurs and. Uh, and Sheffield United, because if we, if we start off poorly, we're going to be we're going to be chasing chasing our tail and and trying to get get into fourth. We'd probably be looking at you know fifth then and and lighting a few candles that Man City's ban is upheld. Yeah, and um, with the Chelsea thing, obviously none, none of us are Chelsea fans here, and of course Everton are, don't look to be getting any Champions League spots. Sorry about that, Paul. But um, the Chelsea one, like. Uh, it's great for them at the moment because, you know, the Hakim Zia coming in and I don't know what he playing the 10 or playing the right and then obviously signing Timo Werner from the Bundesliga, a fantastic player, good goal scorer, pace, he fits into that system perfectly. But if I'm a Chelsea player, if I'm Tammy Abraham who's been working on a new 100,000 a week deal or if I'm Willian or Pedro or any of these, or even Ruben Loftus-Cheek who could be completely replaced without even coming back, like, those lads are still there and they are the ones who has to fight for Chelsea over the next eight games. And if I'm them, I'm kind of like, look, the Chelsea are signing all these players and linked to all these players and I'm the one breaking my back here for a club that I might not be at next year. I, th I think there's there's obviously pros to wrapping up a Werner deal or a Havertz deal or a Ziyech deal nice and early, but you still have to p take care of your own players. And I feel if I was a player at Chelsea, not that I'll ever be, but just saying, I'd be like, look behind my back saying, what's the point in me playing eight games for these this team and they're just going to sell me off to whatever, whoever bids for me kind of thing. Yeah, well, I know your point. I think that can go I, that can go both ways. I think it would also make pe people perform because they know that they're almost playing for, for their futures. Look, we all know that a lot of these young players got their chance because Chelsea had a transfer ban. Who knows whether they would have got it. I don't think Lampard would have got the job. He was brought in the man to bring them through. And it was crazy with Chase, Chelsea. They'd won the FA Youth Cup like five years in a row and no players were getting into the first team. Now, it has happened this year. They played good football. They've been entertaining to watch, but entertaining to watch because they could just as likely lose a game as win it. Um, I think they're good. It's. I think it actually is is a positive for them because a lot of them players w will know that they have to play, and they have a manager there and Frank Lampard, who who'll be quite tough on them as well. He'll be a hard tar 
uh, Taskmaster, like he often talks about the reason why he kept elevating his game as a Chelsea player was because he knew they were going to keep signing these top class players. So we had to get better and better season by season. So I think the Chelsea players that fall away because, oh no, we think somebody might be coming in to take our place. Then there might be other ones who step up and get better. It's the ones who step up and get better that you know you want in your squad long term. So I think it might actually separate the men for the boys a little bit in, in that regard, you know. And it, it's Chelsea. They, like they were never not going to start sign, signing big players again. And I think they, there, there is a feel good factor there from like Zayak is a quality player, Werner linked with Havertz. And they kind of know that a lot of clubs in financial turmoil at the moment. Abramovich still has billions, billions. Yeah. You know, he's he's prepared to get the deck book out. So uh, I think they could. Re- it, it was a real step in statement of intent. You're like you're a Liverpool fan. That looked like that was done and dusted. He was pulling up his skirt and winking at Jurgen Klopp all yeah. season in the press. Like so, for him to then go and and Chelsea wrapped that up. It was it felt like a real statement of intent. I do think we, we, William and Pedro are probably on the way out the door anyway this summer. Fair. Yeah, fair. Well, Paul. Um... What do you think? Because the fact that there is, I think there was three players that, that are out of contract, um, William, Giroud and um, Pedro, Pedro? Are, are, are all out of contract, you know, and, and would have been gone by now if, if the season was ended. So, you know, it might be a case of, you know, player power as well, where, where they're saying, I don't want to go out there and, and, and go full pelt in case I get injured. You look at the injuries at the moment, there's so many players getting injured. I watched the uh, in Germany, there's players getting injured all the time. The, the risk is much higher since they've been back from the corona, which is natural because they're all coming back so quick. Uh, I was watching Galatasaray playing last night. Don't ask me why I was watching them, but they were just on. Um, and they had, all their strikers were all injured. But Paul, we've kind of hardly heard from he, from you. So I want to know your kind of take on the those types of things, like the players not coming back. And then we'll kind of go into the, the fixtures then because I think it's kind of between Leicester United, Chelsea for that top four. You know, Liverpool and City are nailed on, and then you're kind of looking around, and in the you know you've got United, uh, Wolves and Sheffield United. I don't see them catching United, but it's a case of as the lad said with the City thing, whether that will open up fifth place as a Champions League spot. You know. Yeah, well, I think with Chelsea as well. Just just going back on them, one of their main problems is their defence as well. Like they've got a y- lot of young players in there and they're conceding loads of goals. I remember watching them in the FA Cup against Hull and as Filiqueta was going mad after they conceded a late goal to like make the game tight again, they were 2-0 up and cruising. Um, I think Giroud got a new contract recently as well for another year and obviously being an Arsenal fan, Giroud is a top quality player on his day. He sets up everything for the team. So... No surprise he got a new contract. I thought he should have been playing ahead of Abraham some of the time anyway. Um, I mean, players come back, the injuries as well, like you said. There has been a lot in Germany. I've been watching Spain over the last few days as well. And with the heat there as well as like just coming back straight into it, playing a game every three days, it's killing them. But again, it's it's like starting a new season again. It's They've had very little pre-season and it's going to be tough for them. but. Like it's, it's they just have to get on with it, really, don't they? Yeah. Well, uh, Gary, what are your thoughts on it? Um, from from that regard, because you know it's just it's it's, it's easy for the players that are, are out of contract to just be like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna run a hundred yards for a ball and pull my hamstring, and then I'm I'm out of missing out on a big my last probably big money move. I mean, I I don't think Giroud would be that type of player where he probably wouldn't run anyway, but um. Mm. Yeah, he's he, he seems like he's in for the team, but I I someone like William kind of strikes me as someone like who would could upset the dressing room if things weren't going his way, and he, if he's seen it as a way of, you know, I know he wanted to stay in Brazil longer or something like that. Uh, it was the first holiday he's had in years because he's usually back and forth with Copa Americas and everything else, World Cups or whatever. But seeing him and maybe Pedro could that could maybe fall into a problem for Chelsea, but then again, it could be United's benefit. What do you think? Yeah, like, I mean, I think it's it's more of an issue for the smaller teams. Like, you saw Lee Boyer's Charlton, Lyle Taylor. He's uh, going gonna, to um, not play for the rest of the season in fear of injury because he's going to get a big move next season. But for those teams, like what Peter was saying, like, I think the likes of William Giroud and, and um, Pedro, they, they'll look to be shipped on anyway. And it might even suit Chelsea that 
you know, they're not going to be playing for another contract because realistically, they're at the end of their tether. Like, it, the three of them are in their 30s and they want to be replaced anyway with the likes of Hakim Ziyech and Pulisic is going to come back in. And of course, the likes of Chelsea have Callum Hudson and Adoy. Um, and they want to kind of blend him into the squad as well. So I, I don't think, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's kind of a strange one because obviously, like, um, Paul was saying, like, Giroud is a, is a good player. And, but like, is he, is he what Chelsea are after? They're literally just about to start a big rebuild. You know, would it, would it be the worst thing in the world if he went on a free? Or would it be the worst thing in the world if Pedro or William went on a free? And they'd still do a job. And I know, like we were saying, that William, would he kick up a fuss? And I remember there was talk of him, you know, starting a couple of arguments with Conte and, and him not getting on with a couple of managers before. But I think all of them now are just at the end of it. And with this happening, look, it's... It's one of those things that, that they will be offered that that kind of contract extension. I don't know if that those two players, William and Pedro, have been um, for the rest of the year or anything like that and then move on. But I, I do feel that it's not the biggest deal in the world if those players either kick up a fuss or um, decide that they don't want to sign a new deal or they're going to be shipped on. Do you know that kind of way? I think when you're looking at the the COVID and the pandemic and everything that happened over the last couple of months, like the, the big things that have happened are the likes of... Pogba coming back from injury, Harry Kane coming back from injury, those big players that have been missing Rashford. out over the last, Rashford coming back from injury, those big players who've been missing out of the, would have missed out in the last eight games of the season or, or a couple of those games will come back and make those Champions League spots more difficult to get for teams around them as well because, you know, Spurs not having Harry Kane, was, it, they're a completely different animal, you know, so it is one of those things that I don't think there'll be many players kicking up too much of a fuss because obviously this is a bit awkward for everyone and I think they'll be happy enough to take their 100 K a week for the next whatever eight weeks for themselves anyway and then try and find a new club regardless of what happens but it is going to be a strange um eight weeks to see what happens in that and also how the transfer market plays out after this like is there going to be a month a half a month two months of it will it will it kind of go into a month of next season and stuff like that so I, I think the players know as much as everyone else at this stage that no one really knows how it's going to pan out and look if we're four games into the season and there's a second wave in england the whole thing is going to be plugged put put the plug's going to be pulled on anyway. So it's one of the things where you have to just take game by game and see what happens and see if you can get those. That's good. Isn't it? <laughs> kind of just the fixtures before we give our predictions. Um, you know, I was just looking there on your article there, Peter. Um, you know, Wolves currently sitting sixth on 43 points and they're, you know, two points behind United. Uh, Wolves remain in fixtures. West Ham away. Bournemouth at home. Aston Villa away. Arsenal at home. Sheffield United away. Everton at home. Burnley away, Crystal Palace at home, and Chelsea away, which yeah, it's not the worst run in when you think about it. Peter, what, what would you think there? Yeah, well, see, I, I think one thing we should highlight as well, um, we don't know how the whole, obviously you're saying home or away, and it's completely natural for us to say that. We don't really know how that's go, going to play out. Your article. No, I know. I mean, how much of an advantage it is to be at home or away? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, of course. Because in Germany, um, it, there was I haven't seen it in the la last weekend, but I know after the first couple of fixtures, um, in in the Bundesliga, the the rate of a home team winning was like fifty percent post COVID, and after the behind behind closed doors fixtures came in, it was down to like twenty percent the home team winning, which kind of tells you that maybe playing home or away isn't going to really have that much of a of a you know of an effect on the results um wolves are a team i really like though and i think they might be hurt because this is basically going to be like an international tournament if that's the way it feels the way this is going to play out over the next while and um wolves have a notoriously small squad um he doesn't really rotate at all all new no he plays the same 11 every week um, so it, it will be really interesting. There's obviously a team we've all watched very closely with with Gary, uh, with, sorry, with Matt Doherty playing at, at right back, and they've got some other players that are really interesting to watch. You know, you've got the two boys and the Portuguese boys in the middle of the park. Uh, Jimenez is a top striker, and I mean Adama Traore in full flight is just is just brilliant to watch. So um, I, I'd I'd find it hard to say they definitely won't make it. Um, they do have some tricky fixtures in that run-in, no doubt about it, although they are playing a couple. The likes of Crystal Palace and Burnley, who, you know, you'd say have very little to play for now at this stage. Um, I, 
it's really a hard one to, to predict this race for the, for the top four. I think probably they'll just miss out, but I, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if they made it in because they're such a tough nut to crack, Wolves. No team likes playing them. Um, they never roll over. Um, their system, everybody knows what it is, but it just seems to be so difficult to get to, to play against. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out with them. But I'd, I'd, I'd tip them to get very close, but fall just short. So, well, Paul, like, what's what? What are your thoughts on Wolves and kind of their real aspirations? I mean, we I don't know if, if you mentioned it, Peter, but they are still in the Europa League as well, which is another thing that we have to kind of take in. I don't know when that's back, but that's another thing they're probably focusing on as well, and probably in the back of their minds that they could probably win it. They have like they do have a squad capable of winning mm-hmm. it. I think. Yeah, definitely. I think I think that might be their main priority when it does come back. But obviously, the main thing now is get back get fitness and do your do the best you can in the league as peter was saying some of the players they have are unbelievable like joe Matinho, he's he's got some quality and this, the experience he has as well it just enhances them them as well you didn't mention uh diogo jota as well like yeah. he was in he was injured for a lot of the season but um like that chap can bang in a goal whenever same as Jimenez they, they're a quality side and their defence fairly solid at the back as well and obviously they have Matt Doherty on right back as well which is a great interest for us having a top season scored the winner against City I mean they they play the right way they're a good side but I think they might fall just short because of the squad size as Peter did say as well I think it it kind of as well like like Sheffield United and stuff like that is it, it, in their defence they've had a, a probably a welcomed rest with this COVID nineteen in in many ways whereas they're probably hitting a dip in form not that they were like rapidly declining but like Leicester um Sheffield United and Wolves small Sheffield, squads Wolves, but Wolves, Wolves. they're basically trying they have the rest now so they'll be able to kind of go in. Now with a f- kind of fresher look and uh, all the players that might have been injured, Carrie Knox or, will probably all be grand by now. But uh, Gary, what are your thoughts on that? While you're checking that, I'm going to check the fixtures. Um, yeah, well, like with Sheffield United and Wolves, for them it's great because um, they really have nothing to lose. They're going into the last eight games of the season, like, and if they don't get it, it's no big deal. They've had a great season anyway. When you look at the likes of Chelsea, United, Spurs, Arsenal, they are all they're all gunning for it, and they want it. Like they're hoping that teams lose, and just, they're hoping that things go their way. But with Wolves and Sheffield United, I think this is this is all like the season stopped now they would have had a fantastic season. So I think they're happy out. And I think that makes them dangerous. Like a team like Wolves, like the Paul and Peter were saying, that the squad is very, very small and that will be an issue. And someone will get injured or a few players will have to miss out. You saw that in any leagues that have started up over the last couple of weeks, that the rotation is absolutely key. And for the likes of City, Liverpool and Chelsea, Spurs, whoever, that, that that's okay. But for teams that weren't expecting... Um, or won't be expecting such high rotation, and they don't play it anyway. Then it might be a bit of an issue. But even like the Sheffield United, like they have they have a, a good few players that they can have fill in uh, in different positions as well. They have like five strikers now. N- none of them are prolific or anything like that. But I don't think that matters when you're coming up against teams that like Sheffield United should be beaten and stuff like that. And they can throw in McGoldrick one day and Moose at one another day and stuff like that. And that is going to be the difference in them and Wolves and United and anyone else going for that for that spot. But I can't wait. I really can't wait to see teams like Wolves and Sheffield United give it a go. And I am a Liverpool fan, obviously. So the season is, is as good as done unless there's something terrible happens um, and Liverpool lose every single one of their remaining games um, and City win all of the rest of theirs, then I think the, the title obviously is wrapped up. So for me, seeing the likes of Sheffield United and Wolves um, trying to get that place against, let's say, United, um, who is a rival or Arsenal or Chelsea or anything like that is, is going to be great. And I can't wait for it to kick off again so those teams can go back in. And I'd say they're going for it as well big time because I was uh, listening to... Uh, Chris Wilder talk already and he was saying that they got he got the players in as quick as possible and they're rare to go and, and they seem to be in, in a good position as well so uh, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see and like P- Peter always said or already said like the likes of Wolves and Sheffield and I not the most ideal fixtures and home and away and whatever but you, like he said as well that doesn't really matter and it's completely different like Sheffield tonight it could show up one day and you know beat Norwich 6-0 and then lose to Villa 6-0 that's the way it is it's just so unpredictable with the way the season can go but I'm really looking forward to seeing how Sheffield tonight and Wolves um, shape up over the next couple of weeks definitely oh, I think just gonna... with... sorry Paul yeah, I, go ahead. I, I think with Sheffield United like you you see uh, the style of play comes 
from the manager, Chris Wilder. Mm -hmm. He's a brilliant manager. They've been brilliant this year. They're so compact and solid. They barely concede goals. And then the fullbacks are unbelievable, including Enda Stevens, our Enda Stevens. So, I mean... Mm -hmm. I don't I don't see them dropping out of those positions anyway. Like even against Villa, like I don't see them losing to Villa. Villa have to win that game, but I just don't see them losing it. Do you know what's the, the really interesting thing about Sheffield United? See you're saying about their their made in the image of their manager or whatever. Like it, obviously there's been a lot of talk about his, you know, how innov innovative Chris Wilder is. Um, but like their strength is 100% their collective. I know the Irish lads have done well and so but like Normally, if a team comes up and performs the way they have, most of the big boys will try and strip the squad in January and they'll all have moves lined up for the summer. There's not really that many other clubs after Sheffield United's players, which kind of shows you that their strength is in the team that Wilder has built. It's, it's how, how he has them playing. Um, and I just wonder with Wolves and Sheffield United, um, we're saying they have a small squad and they don't right, rotate, but I think we have to remember for all of these teams, there's going to be five substitutes as well. So it'll be an extra kind of, um, you know, you're always looking to see if a manager gets his three subs right in the game. You know, he might have a bit of room for error now. And, you know, there might be kind of players like a, a third or fourth try, choice striker that normally wouldn't get a run that could come on and make himself a hero. You never know. Well, I think it, we'll probably go through the... Um... The remaining fixtures for the clubs who are most likely. Like I don't see Arsenal challenging for the fourth spot. Yeah. You know, I think it's more realistic. Yeah. Uh, Sheffield United or Wolves will push Man United, uh, Chelsea and Leicester. But at the same, I don't see um, I don't see Sheffield United getting the Champions League spot. I'd love if I was wrong. And obviously, from an Irish point of view, I'd love to see our Irish players playing at the very, very top level. And obviously, it all depends on if that fifth spot will um, become. Uh, Champions League spot, but I don't think it will. I think City's lawyers will will bail them out somehow. But um, I'm just gonna go through from Leicester their remaining fixtures. Uh, I'm gonna go through the the whole lot on their remaining fixtures, and then I'll let you guys uh have your pick and see who you would choose to finish in the top four. So Leicester in third, um, Watford away, Brighton home. I just, I'm not actually gonna say home or away anymore. I'm just gonna say Watford, Brighton, Everton, Palace. Arsenal, Bournemouth, Sheffield United, Spurs, and Man United on the last game of the season, which would be interesting. Um, then you've got Chelsea in fourth place, and they have uh, Villa, City, West Ham, Watford, Crystal Palace, Sheffield United, Norwich, Liverpool, and Wolves, which is tough enough run running. Um, then you've got Man United in fifth with uh, Spurs, Sheffield United, Brighton, Bournemouth, Villa, Southampton. Crystal Palace, West Ham, and then Leicester on the last game of the season, which again would be tough. Um, I've got Spurs, um, Spurs remaining fixtures: Man United, West Ham, Sheffield United, Everton, Bournemouth, Arsenal, Newcastle, Leicester, Crystal Palace, and then Sheffield United, Villa, Newcastle, Man United, Spurs, Burnley, Wolves, Chelsea, Leicester, Everton, and Southampton. I already gave you Wolves. Is um, so if you're looking at that, uh. If you had to pick now, going to your head, Paul, who would be your choice uh, to finish in the top four? Or are we going to say top five? Um, I'll, I'll say top five. I think uh, Leicester will finish third because they're just that bit ahead and they're just going to win games. They're a very good side. And uh, I think United will take fourth off Chelsea because now with Bruno Fernandes coming in, Rashford's back fit, Martial as well. They're probably a better side than Chelsea, really, beating them twice already this season. And I think Chelsea would just missed out in fifth simply because of the youth of the team, lack of experience. Even though there is experience there as well, there's a lot of youth players too. So I think Leicester and United for me. Gary? Um, depending on if you know Man City get their ban. Um, so I'll go Liverpool top, City with the ban, obviously not getting Champions League, then Leicester third, Chelsea, then United. So as is, and United obviously getting into that Champions League spot because of uh, City and the ban. But I just, th I just think Chelsea have something as well to offer. There's, there's still a lot of, to play for in that team, and a couple of injuries come back as well. And Lampard is, you know, he's done well with that squad. And I don't know, I just, I see Chelsea winning a lot of games as well. I, th I think it will kind of end as is. It'll be interesting to see if uh, Wolves and Sheffield can push United for that spot as well. But I'm I'm being a bit boring, but you know, allow me to be boring this time, please. 
I think well, I think you're allowed to be born until the ball is kicked, really, and then you'll have True. a little bit more. Peter, what's your uh, take on it? Yeah, it's a tough one. I, like, um, I probably if if I had to put money on it, forgetting the fact I am a Man United fan, I I, I do think United you know, were on a very good run before. Um, they kept nine clean sheets out of out of eleven odd games, and that's in all competitions. Um, whether they can get you know, like I said, Rashford coming back some massive boost. He was having the season of his career. Bruno Fernandez, Pogba will probably be eased back. They were talking about today instead of going straight back in. But I think United might just nip Chelsea because when you watch Chelsea, they're very good to watch, but they're a bit gung ho. Like they, they've no structure in midfield really. When another team gets the ball, they they don't defend very well at all. That that's why they're so entertaining to watch because. You know, you know, there's going to be goals whenever you see them, but I'm not sure that's the right approach. You know, heading towards the the final, the final weeks of the season, but it's so hard to tell. You know, we, we read off these fixtures, and normally we have a much better read how any of this stuff is going to go. But there's so many kind of things that make things different here in terms of, you know, nobody knows what it's going to be like. Like Liverpool looks like a really tough game, but you know, Klopp could start building for next season. You know, are Liverpool going to be that interested? You know, it could be worse. Playing a team like Watford fighting for their life actually might be a tougher fixture now than playing Liverpool or Man City when they don't really have much to play for, you know. So, um, yeah, there's there's so many twists and turns and we'll have to see how other things go on the table that make, you know, the team you're playing against, do they have something to play for or not? So, um, yeah. <laughs> Man United, though, Paul, went on a bit of a waffle there. But I go with Man United. I was on a podcast earlier and I pretty much predicted the same thing as yeah. uh, as Gary. Um, so I, I went on a bit of a tangent there as well. But I do think <laughs> what's going to be interesting is the likes of having Rashford back, uh, how Pogba and um, Fernandez will contribute together and if they'll be on the same pitch together, which would be interesting to see. And then you still have the likes of Harry Kane coming back. be interested to see how he gets on with the Spurs. But I think we've got a... I, th- I think it's one of those things where we don't even really associate Spurs in this race anymore. You know, even with Mourinho, which is bizarre, because in any other season you would have said that. But I think at this point, I think it's gone on too far. And I think I think Mourinho's going to be pretty much judged based on next season. Um, had COVID-19 not happened, maybe he would have been judged a bit more. But same as Ancelotti, Arteta and these types of managers to ultimately be judged on what they do next season. Um, so if I was going first, obviously Liverpool, it's a formality for them uh, before they win the league. Then you have Man City in second. And I think I think Leicester will stay in the top four, whether they finish third or fourth, I'm not sure. But I think they'll stay there. And I, I went into detail kind of about... Um, the the rest that the smaller squads will have and I think Leicester will have benefited from that and they've got a really good team there and as well as that they've won the league so they have some players still in that dressing room that will have the mentality that will want to keep them up there your Jamie Vardy's your Casper Schmeichel's your Wes Morgan and even Johnny Evans who's won leagues as well so I think experience in that regard will come in to play for them and then with Chelsea Again, I, I I think Chelsea I think Chelsea will, will just about do it. Um but I'll be interested to see how strongly United finish and I'm looking for that's just something I'm looking forward to because there's not much else to really look forward to. Obviously, as I mentioned, Liverpool it's a formality for them in the league, so there's not not a lot uh going on other than the relegation battle, which we'll be doing in a separate podcast, which you can listen to after this. Um but yeah, uh top five, that's how I would pick it. Um I would hope I'm wrong. I would love if I'm wrong and someone like Sheffield United got in ahead of some team above them. Sorry if that offends any of you, but I'd just love to see see them up there. But if not, so be it. And Wolves to win the Europa League, of course, and of course. get Champions League next season. So that's kind of how I see it. But top five, as I said. Yeah, no team has kind of benefited from the break more than Spurs, though, you'd have to say, because they weren't just like before the break, they'd lost Harry Kane, they'd lost Son. They'd lost Bergwijn. They basically had no attack. I think they had the Lucas Moura. That was it. Their only, you know, experienced striker um, or attacking player. So Mourinho must. I personally, I don't think Spurs will. That team just looks jaded. It needs. It needs a serious reboot. Their defense, Vertonghen and and Alderworld look like they've aged so much over the uh, a short space of time. But there's no doubt that. You know the, the Spurs t- squad that will be coming back after COVID is so much stronger 
than the one that 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 finished you know yeah definitely uh but the, like i just don't see spurs as you mentioned there like the players that they have and i, I was on a podcast earlier with the energy show and i was saying that exact same thing you said about the defenders like you, you just don't see them as a real force anymore and even the team that got to the champions league final you know they, they scraped getting to that final it wasn't like they you know you weren't impressed by them going into the final i think you said off air gary you know you much rather faced them because you knew that you weren't really facing the spurs team that were going to come out and do anything to you yeah of course like you know at the time harry kane was injured and harry kane seemed to be on and off injury for the last 12 months but when he's 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 uh you know, fit and fire, and then they're they're a scary team. They're an outfit that don't really have to perform that well, and he'll still knock up with a goal or two, and you can win games like that anyway. Even though it's not the most beautiful football, and not that Mourinho plays the most beautiful football anyway. But I think they are a little bit too far behind, obviously now to be challenging top four or anything like that. But there's, I think I think they might get into Europe. I think what uh, Peter said is a good point that they are one of the teams in the best positions after after the three months out. They're getting their best players back. Um, obviously, Mourinho. You know, having some extra time with them as well, and 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 bedding it in because it wasn't going well. It wasn't. Go- it hasn't been going well for Spurs since they lost to Liverpool in that Champions League final, and even maybe a little bit before that. So yeah. this three months could have done them the world of good. Um, and like like the main thing is really is is the Harry Kane thing, and like human son as well, who's been suffering for the injuries the last what eight months or so, in and out of the team as well, and haven't hadn't really looked himself, and haven't really looked themselves as as players on the pitch anyway, regardless of the manager. Like you, you can't. You can't suggest that you know Son has been in top form or Harry Kane when he has played has been fit and firing and even the, some of the signs that they brought in have they affected much? Not not at all, really. To be honest, like and N- N- Dombele and and Fernandez, the players that they brought in, like they haven't done anything. But this three months could be perfect for them. You know, it could be absolutely perfect for them. They could come back and win all the rest of their games when they still might not get into the the top four. But I reckon they need a the big rebuild as well, just like Arsenal and the likes of Chelsea and even to 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 an extent Man United do as well over the summer and see how they get on. But yeah, I think it's just a little bit too late. And if the if the if the season had stopped maybe a month and a half before it did, I think they would have been in a real shot of, of going for it if they got all their players back uh, from injury. But I just I just think they're too far away at the moment. Okay, Paul, just before we wrap up, have you anything to add on that? Yeah, I just think Spurs are in the same boat as Arsenal really, to be honest. They've both been terrible this season and they're too far off. Uh, they're hope Again, they're hoping for teams to drop points and they're hoping for the whole City situation to go in their favour. I just don't see it happening for either of them. You're a cynic, Paul. Okay. <laughs> yes, I am. I support Arsenal. On that bunk there. there. <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. Uh, huge thanks to Peter Henry from the Football Faithful for, for joining us today. And we all know Paul Tierney and Gary Curran by now. Um, so, yeah, Peter, thanks very much. And obviously, if you don't know about the Footy Faithful, make sure to give them a follow on Instagram. Is it on Facebook? Are you on Twitter yet? Yeah, we're on all your all your leading social platforms. Are, but yeah, thanks so very much, Matt. Enjoyed that. No, good crack. So, yeah, make sure to check out Peter. And... Um, yeah, make sure to check out his articles as well because obviously we got all of our information there for this episode from there. So make sure to go check it out. And uh, don't forget to subscribe and leave your thoughts in the comments as always. Um, start getting in there and engaging with us. We'll speak to you all soon. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, and thanks for watching if you're watching on YouTube.